May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, where we read as follows that portion of God's Word, which will be the sermon text. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. So far the text. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who died for our sins, dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true and only living, creating and preserving triune God. What's the most important thing in your life? What's the most important thing to you in your life? Is it your health? Is it your hobby? Is it your career, or your job? Is it success? You know, we did a... Uh, survey of Pena sent a questionnaire to every household in Pena not too long ago. That was one of the questions we asked. And I was kind of surprised at how many people responded to that question by saying their family was the most important thing to them. Family. Talk to some people and they say, well, the most important thing to them is knowledge, learning, education. Some people are not quite that serious minded. The most important thing to them is their appearance, their clothes, their hair, and so forth. Or maybe it's music. And they constantly are plugged in to their favorite songs. Some people, it's sports. They follow sports constantly. To some people, the most important thing to them is their fame, their reputation, their popularity, how many people they can call their friends. To some people, the most important thing to them is money. Some people might even say the most important thing to them is their church. 
Some people might say, well, the most important thing to me is God's commandments. Well, in our text, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, tells us what he thought was the most important thing in life. First priority. He says in verse 3, I delivered unto you first of all, most important, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, meaning according as it was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, and most importantly, he died for our sins. There is nothing more important than that. And it's what he calls in the first verse, the gospel. That is the gospel. The gospel of God's grace. He talks about the grace of God later on in verse 10. and It's all the same thing. The gospel is how God has grace for us. Undeserved kindness. Instead of punishing us for our sins, he punishes himself for our sins and forgives all of our sins to us. That's God's grace, undeserved kindness, so that God the Father sent God the Son down into this world to die for our sins on the cross. God's grace caused him to do that. And that's good news, and that's what the word gospel means. It's good that God has grace. It's good that God has come down from heaven, become a man, lived a sinless life, taken all of our sins upon himself, and died in our place for them, so that God forgives us all of our sins. There's nothing more important in life than this. Our whole life here and for all eternity is dependent upon this. And so Paul says, I delivered unto you first of all. Nothing more important than this. Now, I think that the people who aren't Christians won't say this. They'll say it's these other things that I listed. It's the most important thing to them. But to a Christian, to a Christ believer, he will answer, this is the most important thing to me in my life. The gospel of God's grace in Christ Jesus. There's nothing more important than that God, the Son, suffered and died for my sins. That God himself didn't just put himself out a little bit for me. He died for me. And he did not just die, but he died to pay for all of my sins. As it says, Paul says so clearly and straightforwardly, Christ died for our sins. God was nailed to a cross and suffered to pay for our sins. For he had no sins. He was perfect and holy and righteous. And yet was willing to die and suffer hell. Be forsaken of God in our place. He died for our sins, as it says here. Should have been us on that cross. Should have been you hanging on that cross. Jesus had no business there. He had done nothing wrong. He was totally innocent. He was there in your place and in my place, paying for all of our sins the eternal price that God demands of his justice upon our disobedience. But because he was there, because Jesus died there for us, 
we are forever free from all of our sins and all of its punishment. This is God's gift to everyone. To each one of us, God gives us this. It is a gift of God that we stand before his judgment seat and he accepts us and does not punish and condemn us. The Bible says, Ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might be rich. The Bible also says, Jesus, by the grace of God, tasted death for every man. In my conversation with people over the years, I think that they think that, that salvation is easy. Yeah, God just, he takes everybody to heaven. Sure, yeah, everybody. God just forgives everybody. Everybody going to heaven. No matter what you believe. It's easy. Salvation is not easy. It cost God his very life. That's not easy. It's only easy for us. Because we have to do nothing. Which is good. Because we can't do anything. God did it all. If he hadn't done it all, there's no way we could have saved ourselves. Salvation costs us nothing, even though it cost God everything. This should be the most important thing to us because it's the most important thing to God. What's the most important thing to God? You. Of all the things in the universe, you are the most important thing to God. So important, he was willing to die for you. If God was willing to die for you, shouldn't he be the most important thing to you? And so God came down from heaven and died on the cross for our sins. And that is the only way to heaven. It's God's free gift. He did it freely for you. It costs you nothing. It cost him everything. But it costs us nothing, which is fortunate because we have nothing to offer. But yet there are so many people who don't believe this. They think they have something to offer God. They think that they can buy heaven with their own good works. I call this the pacifier effect. You know what a pacifier is. Pacifier is something you give a baby when they're, they're fussing because they're hungry. And this fools them. It's called the fooler. The baby goes through the motions without the satisfaction. Well, this is what the devil does to most people. He gives them the pacifier of their own good works, their own good deeds. They go through the motions thinking, oh, this, is, this makes me feel good, but it doesn't satisfy God. Our good works don't satisfy God's justice. If we do good works in obedience to God, God says, you're only doing what I commanded. You're not paying off former sins. And so Satan gives us a pacifier, and most people have believed it. 
They think that, well, I went through the motions of doing a few good deeds. Didn't satisfy God. It doesn't satisfy them in their need for Jesus Christ. It didn't get them into heaven. It didn't pay for their sins. And it doesn't even bring them peace. Only Christ can do that. Don't settle for the pacifier that Satan gives you. The real thing is Jesus Christ. Put your trust only in him. The other part of the gospel that uh, our text speaks of is that, yes, Jesus died for our sins. But that's not all. There's more. He rose again from the dead. He didn't stay dead. He was resurrected, we say. And we speak of this not just on Easter Sunday, but we remember this every day. Because it was his resurrection that is the proving point of our faith in him. Anybody can say anything they want. Doesn't make it true. But if that person dies and rises from the dead on the third day, that makes it true. Now you can trust it. Here is the person that has the key to life. Hear him. Believe him. He has proven what he has said. Will you rise from the dead? Will you rise from your grave? You will, but that resurrection depends, it stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If no one before us had ever risen from the dead, it would only be a pipe dream. But Jesus has risen from the dead, and that proves our resurrection from death. And here, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, goes to great lengths to show that Jesus' resurrection from the dead is a proven historical fact. Because he now lists all of the witnesses who saw Jesus alive after he had been crucified, dead, and buried. They saw him alive. How many witnesses? Verse 6, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. Verse 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. If you want to go ask him, is what he's saying. When this was written, many of these witnesses were still alive, and they could have been asked. It's a fact. It's a historical fact seen by witnesses. Jesus rose after he died. And he really did die for your sins and paid for them all. That is why this is called the good news. It's what gospel means, the good news. It comes from the Greek word, for messenger of, of good news. It's what the messenger came from the battlefield after a victory would say in the towns. We won, we won, we won. That's the good news. That's the Greek word, gospel. We have won. Christ's victory over death and sin is our victory. 
He gives us that victory. The justice of God, that's bad news. The wages of sin is death. We deserve that death and we deserve hell. That's bad news. But the gospel of God's grace is good news. Your sins are forgiven by God for Jesus' sake. In fact, it's not only good news, it's the best news. It's the most important thing in our lives. Good news. One day Martin Luther was very sad and very despondent. He was really down. And this went on and on day after day for a week. And so his wife, Kate, put on black, dressed in black. And Martin Luther asked her, why are you dressed in black? And she said, well, because God is dead. And Martin Luther said, who says so? And Kate said, Martin Luther, because he's acting that way. God is not dead. God lives. Jesus is not dead. Jesus rose from the dead, and he lives. And God's grace and forgiveness is real. And the Apostle Paul here, under inspiration, does not just point to the gospel of grace as a general principle. He then applies it. He says, look at me. I am a living, breathing example of God's grace. And he talks about how I persecuted the church of God at the end of verse 9. I persecuted the church of God. He was the most rabid hater of Christ, the most rabid persecutor of Christ's disciples. But on the road to Damascus, Christ appeared to him and changed him and made him from a persecutor of Christianity into a Christian himself. Not just a Christian, but an apostle, one of the chosen ones who would be Christ's witnesses and who would write the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And not only an apostle, but he became, as he says here, the greatest apostle of them all because he did more work to spread the gospel of grace the grace of God in Christ Jesus, he did more to spread that than any of the other apostles. So he went from the greatest persecutor of the church to the greatest spreader of the gospel. The greatest turnaround in the history of the world. And Paul says, I am a living, breathing, walking example of the grace of God. By the grace of God, I didn't do this. I didn't bring this change to myself. I didn't make a decision for Christ. I decided against Christ. If it was up to me, I'd still be persecuting Christ. But he changed me. By his grace, he came to me. On the road to Damascus, his grace took me, not only to be one of his disciples, but an apostle. And I take no credit for this, Paul said. It's all because of God's grace. And because of this, Paul knew that through Jesus Christ, all of his detestable sins, all those horrible things he had done in his past were forgiven. Paul later wrote, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. No wonder Paul felt that the gospel of grace was the most important thing in life. It had completely and totally changed his life. 
And then to deliver this gospel, to preach this gospel of forgiveness in Christ was the most important thing he did for the rest of his life. Paul wrote, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Would that people today put that much importance in the gospel. A Christian should receive this gospel, as Paul says here, which ye have also, which, which ye have received, in verse 1. It's the first thing, receive it, hear it, come to know it. And then he goes on, and whereon, wherein ye stand, not only hear it, but believe it, stand on it, base your life upon it, base your eternity upon it. Trust that you are saved through it. Because that's what he says in verse 2, by which also ye are saved. But then also we take it out to others and we evangelize it. And not only that, but we retain it. As he says, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Not just hear it once and believe it once, but... Retain it. Day after day, week after week, month after month, our whole life. And even if necessary, suffer as Paul did for the sake of it. It is the gospel of God's grace that keeps us together as believers in Christ in our church. That we all have this same exact faith. And yet it seems to be in most churches today that uh, the byword is whatever you do, don't get fanatical about your religion. Don't be a fanatic. But Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Top priority. Most important thing in life. It should be to every church member, to every believer in Christ. Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Even then our family, the gospel of God's grace in Christ Jesus should be more important. be a Christian, a Christ believer, you must believe this gospel of God's grace in Christ Jesus. To believe just anything isn't good enough. A lot of people talk about faith today. Faith this and faith that. As if it doesn't matter what the content of that faith is what you believe, just believe something. Believe in some God, believe in some philosophy of life, just have some kind of a faith. And in a lot of churches, there are people who say, well, I want to be called a Christian, I want to be a Christian, but I want it on my own terms. I want to believe what I want to believe, and I want to do what I want to do. That's not a Christian. A Christian must believe this gospel of grace. It doesn't matter how good a person thinks he is, or how sincerely he believes what he believes, or how hopeful that, that makes him of the future. If you do not trust the gospel of grace.
God's grace in Christ Jesus. I delivered unto you, first of all, that Christ died for our sins. That's the gospel of grace. And it can be wasted on you. As Paul says here at the end of verse 2, unless ye have believed in vain. You can fall away from this faith where this gospel of grace is not important to you anymore. As it says elsewhere in the Bible, you trample underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. It's unimportant. It's not important to me that Jesus lived a sinless life. It's not important to me that he is God Almighty. It's not important to me that he suffered for me. It's not important that he died on a cross for me. It's not important that he rose from the dead. It's all for naught. But rather, may it be the most important thing. First of all, in our lives. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.